the Villa fans call him God, and he certainly is. Everyone's got so much respect for him, a lot of respect for him, and a lot of time for him. Just phenomenal. This guy is just phenomenal. Magnificent footballer, and will be remembered by everyone who watched Villa in the last 10 years. There is a man that they call God in the halls of Villa Park. His chant bells out at every Villa match, without fail. Every club has their icons, their legends, but this man transcends even those honours at Aston Villa and for the Republic of Ireland. This is the story of a quiet man who stood tall on the football pitch, fought against all odds at every moment and claimed immortality amongst the fans of the clubs he played for. This is the story of Paul McGrath. The secret child of an interracial relationship, everything was against Paul from the moment he was born. Forcibly taken away from the arms of his mother Betty due to the influence of religion, he was passed through foster care, something that Paul would later describe as institutionalizing. This would not help at all with his future and the struggles to come. Despite growing tall and suffering abuses alongside racism and bullying whilst in care, McGrath grew to be a gentle giant. Delving into his passion for football, becoming professional and earning a living from it. His early career was dominating for Dublin-based St. Patrick's Athletic. It led to him being dubbed the Black Pearl of Inchicore and claiming the FAI Player of the Year in his first season. At 21, it was to be his last heist of the Irish top flight as Manchester United came calling. The Red Devils from over the water actually lowballed McGrath and it almost scuppered the move. McGrath was earning more money working shifts as an apprentice metal worker alongside his football at St. Pat's and United were offering. The world of football should thank Paul for taking a chance. Despite his ability, Paul's shyness and willingness to take a back seat and a bark in dressing room conversations didn't help him succeed at Manchester United. Players like Norman Whiteside beamed with confidence. McGrath did not. The two would become close, but McGrath just couldn't absorb the belief that Whiteside had in himself and his own abilities. McGrath's raging nerves couldn't be tamed, and he turned to alcohol to settle his clouded mind before games. It did not help at all that McGrath just refused to forgive himself for simple on-pitch errors, nor did it help that a dressing room drinking culture was alleged to be thriving at Manchester United under Atkinson. Reoccurring injuries, a failure to secure a title for Manchester United in 1986, and the arrival of Sir Alex Ferguson put pay to McGrath's United career. It is said that Ferguson tried everything to get McGrath fit. The soon-to-be Manchester United legend was apparently stunned by what he thought was a total lack of application and professionalism by the players, and he threw McGrath in with the rowdy bunch causing the trouble. With injuries piling up and a lack of progress on the fitness side with McGrath, one of the final straws was a fateful TV appearance from both McGrath and Whiteside, where both appeared to have sank a few pints before going live. It was a bit of a, a stopping point with Middlesbrough, but hopefully we can continue now in the, uh, in, in, in the FA Cup. Ferguson almost immediately offered to pay McGrath off should he retire from football there and then. Once more, McGrath made a fateful decision. He continued to train for Manchester United after turning down the offer to retire and transferred to Aston Villa. And this is where his story really begins. Following a fairly heated exit from United, Villa and his international team Ireland were able to give McGrath the space and time he needed to become the player he was meant to be. They're also willing to provide the two things he truly desired, fate and love. Jack Charlton's shoulder round the arm approach at Ireland along with the nature of Graham Taylor, Ron Atkinson and Brian Little and Villa allowed McGrath, at this point a fairly senior figure, to deliver. Villa Park became home to McGrath who was at first shocked by the sound of fans singing his name. The grand home of the villains became the backdrop for the brightest and the darkest years of McGrath's life. Thankfully, he had support from the aforementioned managers, otherwise we might be telling a different story today. Bo Taylor and Charlton chose kindness when confronting McGrath about some serious issues. Make no mistake, they were indeed serious. McGrath's self-doubt and agonizing lack of faith in himself led to a number of suicide attempts. Alongside his battle with painful injuries that prevented him from training almost entirely, and a drowning tide of alcohol, it became clear that McGrath could not see a way out. It's here that we get the stories of McGrath playing drunk, players smelling alcohol on his breath, and even sadly, McGrath hiding self-inflicted wounds with wristbands and bandages during a game. Were you ever, did you ever find yourself drink drunk on the pitch then, playing? Yeah. 
Yeah, I def, def, most definitely. Really? Yeah, I, I've, I've played. <laughs> I know for a fact I played against Alan Shearer, um, drunk. Often enough, McGrath's admission of playing under the influence of drink is told as a boys will be boys tale. Even when he spoke out about winning a Man of the Match award while drunk in an interview at RTE, the crowd just met it with laughter. Did you ever win Man of the Match after a game when you were drunk playing? Uh, I'm afraid I did. Um, Duncan Fer it's because Duncan Ferguson, uh, I'd come back, as I said, from Ireland to yes. play against Evan. And I jumped up for the first uh, um, ball with him and I actually headed the ball. And I couldn't believe I headed the ball. Thankfully, at the time, those closest to Paul took it extremely seriously. Villa's team crowded him with support, covering for him when needed, but it was Taylor who stepped in to potentially save McGrath from himself, even offering a place in his home for the struggling defender. Well, I was uh, on a downer, basically. Mm. So, and, and Graham had come, come to me and just said, Paul, look, if you want to come and stay with myself and Rita, you're welcome to do that and we'll, we'll, we'll get you right. And I just thought, Jesus, this man's a saint. From the moment a scarred McGrath covered up his wounds to sally out onto the football pitch for Villa, his squad mates and Graeme Taylor, he fought harder than ever for himself and the team. Under Taylor and a successive manager, Ron Atkinson, Villa became title challengers, finishing second on two occasions, with one of those seasons, 1992 under Atkinson, becoming a defining year for the age of McGrath. In 1992, the first Premier League season, a mainstream defensive tactic was completely annihilated with the introduction of the back pass rule. Here, now was he in two minds about passing back to the goalkeeper? I think he may have been. While it meant that goalkeepers had to become better footballers entirely, it also caught out defenders who lacked grace on the ball under pressure. McGrath flourished in this new era, relying on his composure, strength and ability to cushion Villa's defence in a year of struggle amongst backlines. Defenders could no longer rely on the safety of a little 1-2 back and forth with their goalkeeper. They needed to become better footballers overnight. Not at all a problem for McGrath. His first goal for Villa would follow and then came three more. In towards McGrath! Ah, oh, that's a beauty! In the 1992-1993 season, McGrath delivered one of the greatest seasons of not just a defensive player, not just an Irish player, but one of the greatest seasons in the Premier League's history. With a combination of Dean Saunders and Atkinson leading the way for Villa, it was left to McGrath to hold the line. He held it against everyone who came his way. McGrath could not be beaten. Atkinson's Villa couldn't quite go the distance, but they proudly settled for second place, with McGrath enjoying a career-defining honour as a result. It was somewhat ironic that a brash set of players would look among their peers and pick out the perhaps the shyest and quietest of them all. McGrath's fellow players elected him to be the first PFA Men's Players Player of the Year of the Premier League era. On receiving the award amidst rapturous applause, McGrath couldn't seem to stare anywhere but away from the eyes of the adoring crowd. Even then, he couldn't stop himself smiling and feeling proud for just a second. However, his speech was cut a little short. Can I just say what I meant to say anyway? It's uh, thanks to the rest of the Aston Villa uh, team, the lads down there, uh, for making this possible. Even in a true crowning moment, the pinnacle of his career, McGrath could not find it in himself to admit that he was actually pretty bloody good. Team glory would follow quickly. Villa claimed two League Cup triumphs in following seasons, including one against Ferguson United. As he approached the summit of his footballing days, there was one last chance for McGrath to remind the world of who he was. And it wouldn't be in the claret and blue of Aston Villa, but in the beaming emerald of Ireland. Following in the footsteps of many a countryman, McGrath travelled to New York City and made a name for himself once more. But under the context of a 1994 World Cup clash at Giant Stadium against one of the true titans of football in Italy, it was Ireland's opening game and they would end up relying on McGrath to seal one of the greatest triumphs in Irish football in history. Not one Italian superstar could get past the seemingly invincible McGrath. Not even the legendary Roberto Baggio could challenge him. Baggio stopped by McGrath. A barely fit McGrath single-handedly shut down Italy, allowing for Roy Houghton's opener to see out the game. McGrath's career would end quietly, with his knees finally given in during 1998 to see out his career at Sheffield United. However, his impact on the genesis of the Premier League, defensive football in England and on Aston Villa and Ireland cannot be understated. 
McGrath doesn't think that the man upstairs would be best pleased about him being named after God by Villa fans. But truth be told, religion had already delivered the impact on Paul's life, and it was only right that McGrath be celebrated by the entire football community, especially the almost religious adoration of Aston Villa fans, which is entirely deserved. It may be blasphemy for sure, but it seems about right for villains to name McGrath as God. He was imperfect. He was ferocious when he needed to be and gentle at all other times. He lacked fate in his clear ability. He felt an imposter when he was surrounded by lesser players than himself. He had his flaws, but he showed true strength and resilience. Naming him God may be a tad bit much, but after all, isn't God built in our image?